Good morning. As I did, uh, suggested, my orders are to introduce uh, Professor Francois Isbour. I know Francois for some years, but uh, I was concerned that I should miss, I shall miss, some details of his biography. So I googled his name, and then I was in mo even more concerned, because reading the long list of his positions and the long list of his publications would take, would take too much time at the expense of his presentation. So I was reminded of a small story I had in my history of reading biographies. And many years ago, before there was an internet, I needed some information about Winston Churchill. And I had at home some kind of American almanac of world leaders and uh, other celebrities. And I hoped to find some information about Churchill there. And indeed I did find. But at the top of the page, there was, I found, Will Chamber Chamberlain. Will Chamberlain, for those who don't know, not Neville, Wilt, was uh, one of the best basketball players in the American uh, Basketball uh, League. And then there was about eight or nine lines on his uh, biography, giving details about his record, the points he made, the teams in which he played, the championship he, he, uh, he, he took, eight or nine uh, lines. At the bottom of the page, there was a Hollywood actress. Again, I don't recall her name, but again, eight or nine uh, lines, giving the list of her movies, the one or two Oscar, she, Oscar prizes she took, and the list of her five or six husbands. Again, eight or nine lines. In the middle, between the basketball player and the Hollywood act uh, actress, I found Churchill. Less than one line. Saying, Winston Spencer Churchill, 1874-1965, a British statesman. That's all. So sometimes just a few words could be better than giving a long presentation. But for those of you who do not, uh, have not looked at the program, I just want to mention that Professor Isburg, an old friend of our institute, I think, uh, is the chairman of the very prominent uh, London-based think tank, IISS, and the Geneva uh, uh, National Security Policy uh, Institute, and he is also special advisor of the uh, Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique in Paris. So after London, Geneva, uh, Paris, we are very happy to have Professor Isbourg here in Tel Aviv, and he's going to speak about the making of national security policy, the French experience. One sir, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ephraim, uh, for your very kind words, and indeed it is, it is great uh, to be here at this uh, institute with which we have uh, uh, both at the personal level but also at an institutional level uh, such a long-standing and happy uh, uh, relationship. Uh, 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 I'm not going to uh, uh, retail, well actually yeah, I am going to retail the old Kissinger story when uh, uh, he was told uh, in the presentation that his biography was too long uh, to be read out, that everybody knew who he was. Henry is purported to have reacted by, by saying, but please, please, please do recite my biography. It pleases me so much. <laughs> Uh, no, seriously, uh, uh, why, why am, am I talking about this topic here today, apart from the fact that you've invited me? Uh, because, indeed, uh, uh, I have had the, uh, the intellectual good fortune of having been involved in a, a rather a French sort of enterprise uh, that is drawing up a jardin à la française. You know the difference between a French garden and, a, and an English garden. A French garden, you, know, you draw it up like this with a plan and uh, the grass has to grow just so high and the trees have to grow like this and uh, everything, everything is meticulously planned whereas the British, they, uh, they purport not to plan and it looks very wild but it's actually very well organized. Ours purports to be very well organized but actually it may not be so much. But just to say that uh, we actually were in France a few years ago in the situation of having to design a French garden. Not because we're French, but because we didn't have a garden. We didn't have a national security concept, doctrine, or organization. Now, I was listening to Yezekiel Dror 
uh, earlier on when he uh, uh, chided uh, the French uh, 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 white paper uh, for not uh, uh, mentioning relations uh, with Turkey. He's absolutely right. We did not mention uh, relations with Turkey. But that was not the object of the exercise. The object of the exercise was actually to, define, to try to define some sort of conceptual framework uh, in fitting with the times in which we live. Trying to establish theory, doctrine, organization, practical measures, uh, which would hopefully be conducive to good policy. Now here I'll simply put a very few, few propositions. If you do not have an explicit national security theory, explicit, uh, comprehensive, broad-spectrum, cross-border national security uh, concept, well, then you are going to be condemned to rely on implicit theories which have been inherited from the past. Someone mentioned earlier on path dependency, past dependency, and path depend dependency, if I can put it that way. And we see it at full play uh, in uh, practical contingencies like how do you deal with Tunisia if you're French, or how do you deal with the Mubarak when you're Israeli? Not very good performances. This is what happens when you have past dependency. Secondly, uh, if you have a good, robust, explicit national security policy, uh, sorry, doctrine, this obviously does not guarantee good practice. Here again, Turkey. The only Turkish policy which I know which looks as bad as the French policy is the Israeli policy. Uh, we have both been extraordinarily convincing in demonstrating our ineptness in handling our relationship with Turkey. So having, uh, as you do and as we do now, uh, I think a reasonably robust national security doctrine does not, is not a guarantee. But once again, if you do not have a doctrine, then you have other sorts of trouble. Now, the French Garden. Uh, what does it mean not to have a national security concept, doctrine, and organization? It means some very practical things. First of all, you don't have an intelligence community. You're not going to have an intelligence community if you don't have a national security concept. Why the hell would you? You're going to have the, uh, the counter-espionage people are going to do things in their corner. You're going to have the external intelligence service doing their thing in their corner. You're going to have... Uh, the financial uh, trafficking, uh, money laundering people doing their stuff in one corner, uh, no intelligence community. You get that, clearly. Secondly, you are going to, you're not going to have uh, a serious crisis planning and serious top level, medium level and bottom level uh, crisis management capabilities. Uh, you are not going to be able to answer the sorts of questions which were posed a few minutes ago here. Who is in charge of planning about the crippling of the energy networks? Who is going to be in charge of societal resilience, etc.? You're not going to have an answer to that. We didn't have an answer to that. We did not have the top level crisis planning organization until very recently. And as for, and this is the third consequence, I said no serious crisis management capability. Well, in this old centralized Jacobin country of France, the epitome of centralization, we didn't have, until a few months ago, a national level crisis management center, the equivalent of COBRA in the UK, for those who... Who know, who know the British system. Uh, quite incredible. How, how, was, how was top level crisis management done? A small room in the interior ministry with a 18th century table, very nice. Uh, and uh, it's called the smoking room, le fumoir. Uh, you had 10 or 12 people uh, uh, dumped into that room in case there was a big problem uh, uh, with none of the tools that you require when you're dealing with a complex, multidimensional, multifaceted uh, national security crisis. That is what you get when you don't have the concept, when you don't have the doctrine, when you don't have the organization. Uh, what were the consequences of 
that situation, well, they weren't that terrible for, for a long time. Why? Okay, we had the terrorist threat like many other countries, but less severe than in many others. Uh, over a 45-year period, we have had globally 40, uh, 400 people killed in terrorist incidents, 200 more or less outside of France, and 200 more or less inside of France. Uh, much, a substantially lower level than the case, of course, of the U.S., but also of Britain or Spain, uh, uh, or, in, of course, Israel. Uh, uh, we did not have major natural disasters to contend with. Oh, here again, over, let's say, a 50-year period, the biggest disaster, industrial or natural, that we had to deal with, 200 people killed in one single incident. Bad, but you know, not societally crippling. Uh, so we were able to muddle along with the absence of national security as a concept, as a doctrine, and as an organization. Uh, but, of course, time marches on. And we had uh, two sets of events, or well, one set of events and one set of uh, 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 societal changes uh, which led us to move away from that situation in which we were. One, of course, is terrorism. Uh, I said we didn't have an intelligence community, but at least from the mid-80s onwards, uh, uh, through a set of unhappy coincidences in the framework of various terrorist campaigns which were taking place at the time, some from the Middle East, some which were domestic, we realized that it was necessary to break down the barriers between, at least in the field of counterterrorism, between the various agencies uh, which, had, uh, which were responsible, which had some responsibility in this arena, and also to establish a solid, effective interface between the legal system uh, and uh, the uh, intelligence system, uh, which we did with, uh, I think, uh, quite a good record. Uh, we did not have the same problems our American friends had during the 90s, for example, in, in, that, uh, in that respect. Uh, but, of course, 9-11 shook us up as it shook everybody up and uh, hastened uh, the movement uh, towards uh, adopting a national security concept. Uh, and the societal changes, well, they're all of those which are encompassed in that buzzword, but it's a buzzword which has a real weight and real consistency, and that is globalization, all of the phenomena related to, uh, to globalization. So here we are uh, around 2002, 2003, well, uh, a number of people in the analyst community and the government community starting to wonder about, you know, how are we going to move away from the system in which we were. Here we had a serendipitous uh, situation, and that was, uh, uh, remember, bird flu? Grippe aviaire, bird flu, uh, H, uh, uh, H5N1 virus. There were great fears uh, that this virus, which still exists, uh, could... Uh, uh, become contagious between human beings, and since its lethality rate is of around 50%, uh, that sort of focuses one's mind. That was the occasion for the first attempt at the top level by the French government to do comprehensive crisis planning. How do you ensure societal continuity, we didn't use the word resilience yet, uh, under circumstances where you would have H5N1, with, of course, the subliminal uh, 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 threat uh, being also how will we cope if we have uh, a biological uh, terrorist attack. And uh, the simple fact of having uh, people starting to work on this kind of planning uh, made uh, the civil service the intelligence people and the analyst community aware of the, the yawning gaps in our system. So it was actually quite an important moment. Then, uh, here again a bit of serendipity, uh, the, the interior minister at the time, this was just after the Madrid uh, terrorist bombings, Dominique de Villepin uh, takes the initiative 
uh, after some suggestions from uh, interested parties, including myself, to launch a uh, white paper on terrorism. Uh, this was done under his successor, which was Nicolas Sarkozy, as interior minister, and with Dominique Villepin as prime minister. So this was a government white paper. And here again, uh, what did we learn, which we should have known, but what would happen if we had a major terrorist attack, no top-level crisis management capability, no top-level uh, planning, a, uh, a, and, of course, the remedies were pointed out, but it was not possible to act on the remedies for domestic reasons, pretty much akin to some of the stuff I've been hearing here, and that is that the political system at the time did not lend itself to the resolution of basic problems as to where will the crisis planning take place? Where will the top-level crisis management capability be located? Not only administratively, but even physically. Is it going to be in the garden of the Prime Minister? Is it going to be in the garden of the Interior Minister? Or is it going to be in the garden of the President? Uh, uh, you know, listening to David Ivry a, a few minutes ago, if you're not able to answer these sort of practical questions, you have nothing. You have nothing. And at the time, we pretty much had nothing. But then in 2007, the political stars came into alignment. Uh, 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 we had a much simpler situation with a president, uh, for a prime minister, and a minister of interior, and a defense minister, uh, who were not, uh, at, at least at the time, uh, fighting, uh, fighting, with the, uh, fighting with each other. So a couple of things happened. One was purely administrative, but actually quite significant, and that was the merger of our two domestic uh, security services into one significantly larger uh, uh, domestic security service called the DCRI. And the other one, which I will now get into for a few minutes, and that was the white paper, which Jerzy Keldro was uh, referring to, the National Security and Defense uh, White Paper. Uh, uh, one year of work by a commission, uh, a bit like your Vinograd commission, I would say, in terms of composition, uh, uh, 30 people, uh, 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 each one of these people uh, also being part of various subgroups and so on. Uh, to cut a long story short, uh, what came out of that uh, uh, in the summer of 2008 when it was formally adopted uh, by, uh, the, by, the, uh, by the French state, president and government, sitting in council? Uh, first, we adopted national security as a category, as a concept. There is such a thing called national security. Sounds simple. You've had it for a long time. The Americans have had it for a long time. Uh, but we didn't. So at the beginning were the words national security. Uh, secondly, that category uh, was going to have, and indeed has, an ample parameter. That is... It covers cross-border challenges. It covers any domestic situation, contingency, if it has a bearing on the security of the nation at large. Uh, typically the sorts of issues which were mentioned earlier on when there was talk about Mount Carmel and so on. Uh, I would add that this didn't happen easily. The infighting between various parts of the government on the adoption of such a concept was very, very harsh because some of the ministers immediately understood what the threat was to themselves, to their bureaucracy. Not the ministers, actually, I should say, but the bureaucracies of the ministries. Uh, the Interior Ministry was going to discover that it was going to have to do crisis planning. Now, culturally, in our interior ministry, the notion of planning for crisis was totally alien. As, as one of the top people was, would say, 
But crisis, for us, it happens every day. We're not like the military who plan for a war which is going to happen God knows when, etc., and they spend their time training. We're on the ground every day. We're not like these military. To do that kind of change is not easy. We were helped by our American friends in practical terms, unwittingly. Uh, the help came in the form of Katrina. The storm, remember the hurricane in New Orleans, 2005, uh, a natural disaster uh, hitting an urban area. National security threat? No, of course not, except that five days later, after the hurricane had struck, they had to send in the 82nd Airborne Division. The 82nd Airborne was the one which did the paratroop landings in Normandy on the night of the 5th of 6th of June, 1944. So uh, Katrina actually helped swing the sense of the discussion at the highest levels uh, when it came to defining, adopting and defining national security as a concept and as a category. We were also helped in a much more conceptual way by two individuals whose name I will mention because we had hearings with a number of foreign practitioners and theoret theoreticians. Uh, one was Sir David Omond, whom many of you will know from the UK. And the other one is uh, somebody whom all of you will know here, and that is Elie Levit. Uh, both of these individuals had a very significant intellectual influence on the way we looked at national security and how we framed our concept. Uh, second change, uh, uh, which flowed, of course, from the, from the previous one, the decision-making machinery was changed. We used to have at the presidential level, a defense council, which did forward planning decisions in the military arena, and we used to have an interior uh, security council, uh, which was supposed to have done the same sort of stuff in terms of domestic uh, security. It actually hardly ever did so, but that's another question. Uh, today, we have one single national security and defense Council as a decision-making body, not as a bureaucracy. We, don't, we did not adopt the American concept of a national security council uh, simply because, like in the UK, uh, we, we, have, we have cabinet government, uh, we have cabinet departments, and therefore uh, uh, we did not... Uh, there was actually very little discussion on this. It was not a contentious issue. Uh, that, no, we're not going to create a national security council. But we should be creating... Uh, and this was one of the white paper decisions, and I'll come back to it in a few minutes, uh, create an advisory security council. That is a body of people who would be selected for their experience, their breadth of vision, uh, their diversity of, uh, of experiences uh, to uh, back up the president and his own people uh, when uh, national security issues uh, were being discussed, either in the planning phase or in the, uh, the policy phase. Uh, another decision, of course, uh, we decided uh, to set up the crisis planning and the crisis management machinery. Uh, uh, the necessary arbitrations were made. I'll also come back to that in a second. There appear, at least it appeared that the necessary arbitrations had been made. Uh, uh, and in practical terms, we finally dug a big hole in the garden of the Ministry of Interior, which is 100 meters away from the President's office, and we finally have uh, we actually have a national security crisis management center. Uh, uh, this was done in about a year's time. It was actually very, if you need a good public contractor for, di for digging holes against missiles, we have a good one. Uh, they did good work uh, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the crisis center. Uh, I, close, I close the sales pitch. Uh, other decisions. Uh, I was talking about concept. I've already moved uh, uh, into organization, but I don't want to skip over the doctrine. Uh, doctrine, we established essentially what in our view were, uh, were three innovations. The first one was analytical, and that was the notion, coming up with the notion of rupture stratégique, strategic 
uh, breaks in existing patterns, linear, linear, uh, uh, non-linear disruptions, if, uh, 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 if, I, if I want to put that in mathematical or paramathematical uh, language, that rupture stratégique in a complex, multidimensional, globalized environment uh, uh, are becoming greater, are becoming more frequent, and are by definition a, uh, not readily uh, predictable either in terms of uh, uh, their phenomenology, in terms of when they happen, and in terms of where they start off. And at, at the same time, the comparative advantage of a country like ours, I would guess many others, uh, will lie in being able to recognize as soon as possible when a rupture stratégique is on the verge of happening or when it has begun, uh, or, and of course some understanding of how it could spread and how it could, uh, and how it could morph because, of course, one, in the age of globalization, one of the things which uh, did strike us at the analytical level was how readily challenges changed in nature at different stages of their development. If you take, uh, if you take uh, health problems, let's say SARS uh, or bird flu or, uh, or, uh, or a bio attack, of course, they start as health problems, but they can morph very rapidly into full-blown national security crises. Uh, Second doctrinal, uh, second doctrinal element uh, that was recognizing as a consequence that what we call connaissance et anticipation, knowledge and anticipation, or uh, uh, maybe a better English translation uh, would be security, uh, knowledge-based security. That this had to be recognized as a full-blown strategic mission alongside the traditional missions of deterrence, of uh, intervention, of protection, uh, uh, and the like. Uh, here again, this did not go without some very, very severe battles, uh, uh, because of course uh, we, we are all familiar with these battles, uh, because they translate notably in, at the Ministry of Defense, but also at the Ministry of Interior, uh, by ferocious uh, battles between those who want more shooters and those uh, who want uh, 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 more information gathering, information processing, information distribution uh, assets. And having knowledge and anticipation recognized as a standalone strategic mission, uh, those, uh, uh, well, that of course was very rightly seen as a threat to the pre-existing balance uh, between uh, uh, money spent on effectors and money spent on what are not effectors. Uh, here we were inadvertently helped uh, by our Israeli friends. Uh, 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 on one of my trips to Israel, uh, I, I stumbled on the, the English uh, version of Haaretz, and it was a very nice piece about the launch, this was, this was in early 2008, the launch of uh, your uh, first uh, ra uh, radar spy satellite, Tex uh, Texar I think it's called. And, uh, well, A, I hadn't realized that you are getting into that part of the space game, and B, there was a sort of capsule description of your space program. And, well, of course, I, as others, have been f tracking your, your space program, but this was a very nice synthesis. So I come back home, and I, and I ask for let's, some less journalistic treatment of the issue, and it quickly became apparent that in this country, which knows the value of effectors possibly more than we do, because you need them more than we do, that you had gotten the balance quite different between effectors and information gathering, processing, and distribution. Uh, and that maybe there was something in there for us to learn. Uh, that helped. Uh, uh, and certainly helped in getting that mission, uh, getting that mission defined. A third, uh, third doctrinal aspect, I already used the resilience word. Uh, that was uh, very much David Oman's influence uh, uh, on us. Uh, but societal resilience is something you plan for. It doesn't happen 
in, it doesn't happen by chance on the day that you need it. Uh, if you haven't planned for it, it's not going to happen. Uh, and here we were struck by the contrast between Madrid 2004, where the, the, essentially the Spanish government was kicked out by an infuriated electorate within the space of 48 hours. The terrorists had led to, the terrorist act had led to regime change. It was very, very powerful. There was no resilience in the system whatsoever. And conversely, the Brits, who had been working on resilience, when they had a similar type of attack uh, uh, the year after, July 2005, and I happened to be in London on that day, and so it was the un, uh, 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 an unexpected witness uh, to how the British coped with that situation. Uh, well, in the case of the Brits, the terrorists failed miserably. They killed many people there too, but they failed. Resilience is something you plan that you organize. Uh, decisions of the white paper, I continue to trot down the list. Uh, the decision to establish an intelligence community. Now you will tell me quite correctly that you don't decree the establishment of an intelligence community. Well, in France we do. That's the way we do things. Uh, it's not going to happen if you don't initially say it has to happen. doesn't mean it will. Uh, but if you don't say it, it's not going to happen in any case. Uh, so there was a working party set up with the chiefs of the various uh, services. And uh, much to my surprise, that part of things went very uncontentiously, much less contentiously than most of the other stuff I've talked about. Maybe part of that was, as the, the Russians would put it, pakazucha, uh, that uh, nobody wanted to be seen as uh, overtly challenging uh, uh, what appeared to be uh, uh, the will of this quote-unquote high-powered body or whatever. But still, uh, the chiefs went along with the notion that there would be a, an intelligence community materialized with the establishment of a national intelligence committee uh, and the creation of the Office of National, uh, national Intelligence uh, Coordinator. Uh, and the man, uh, some of you know him, uh, Bernard Bajolet, was designated in the weeks which followed the issuing of the, uh, uh, of the, the white paper. And finally, uh, uh, the, the budget measures, uh, which David Ivry uh, mentioned. Uh, well, first of all, and this was independent of the white paper, but it, it was fortuitous and fortunate that it did happen at the same time. Uh, uh, we, had moved, uh, from two th we were moving from 2010 onwards into three-year budgets for defense, triannual, triannual defense spending uh, budgets. Nice. Good to have. Uh, uh, along, along with the longer term, six years usually, uh, military planning uh, bills, uh, which have a less mandatory character uh, than the budget bills. Uh, in parallel, uh, in, at least on paper, a similar process in the field of interior, uh, uh, which had begun a few years earlier to play with multi-year planning uh, bills as well, and one was put on the launch pad uh, uh, as part of the white paper process with increased spending, notably for uh, 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 CRBN-related uh, contingencies, uh, uh, resilience planning, and the reorganization of the Ministry of Interior, because none of this would make sense if we didn't at the same time create a crisis, uh, a, a, plan, uh, a crisis planning directorate in the Ministry of Interior, which was duly set up. And, of course, uh, if you put such a high premium on knowledge-based security, you had better get your understanding of cyberspace right, and hence the establishment, uh, which was formalized uh, uh, last year, of a, uh, of a budding a cyber defense agency. Uh, we are streets behind you guys in this respect, uh, but at least uh, we've got enough, uh, I think, on the right track. Uh, those were uh, the basic decisions, along, along with the funding package, uh, uh, which entailed 
over the lifetime of the, uh, uh, of the white paper, that is until the early 2020s, uh, a moderate increase, a bit more than one, about 1% 1 a year above inflation uh, over, uh, over the period. Nothing to crow about, uh, but uh, actually not bad, and with a fairly good coherence between what the white paper set out to do and what was, uh, uh, and what was decided in budget terms. Inside of the envelope, doubling of the space budget, very significant increases in the Intel uh, services, security services budget, uh, and uh, spending, of course, uh, in the field of, uh, uh, of resilience. And when I talk space budget, I'm obviously putting into that package uh, uh, all, uh, 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 various types of spy satellites, uh, uh, missile early warning, uh, ELINT, uh, optical, and so on. Uh, that was 2008. Where are we two years later? What lessons can we draw? Well, first of all, let me start with one basic lesson. All of this was done in a very typical French way in a French context. Uh, most of the stuff I'm talking about here, you have already done. In, uh, not in all instances, but in many instances, you had did it way a long time before uh, we did. Uh, you have been cultivating a, uh, an evolving garden. We had to start from scratch. Started literally from scratch. There was nothing there a few years ago. Uh, and of course, that means that replicability is fairly low because most other countries uh, have n were not in the situation in which, uh, in which we were. Uh, so e e even if you were tempted, which I, I, I'm not sure you would be, but if you were tempted to do like we do, I, don't, would, not, I would not make that advice, would not give that advice. Uh, now, uh, uh, what we have learned and how things have been evolving. Uh, first of all, some good news, good surprises. Uh, good news, uh, you know, when I said 1% real increase over a 15-year period of defense spending is actually not so bad. Well, why do I say it's not so bad? Because most, much of the stuff which was prioritized in the white paper uh, corresponds uh, to the logic of Moore's law. You're talking information technology, information gathering, information processing. You all know Moore's Law, uh, the doubling of the ability of a, of a computer chip uh, at a constant price every 18 to 20 months, uh, ever since Dr. Moore formulated his empirical law uh, back uh, some, 40, uh, some 40 years ago. So Moore's Law, rather than Augustine's Law, John Deutsch knows all, all about August, Norm Augustine. He'll talk about that later on. Uh, Augustine's law, which is more or less the doubling of the cost of defense platforms uh, with every change of generation. Uh, so if you're heavy on Moore's law, you're doing better at a given level of budget spending than if you're heavy on Augustine's law. Uh, so that theoretically was good news. I'll, I'll say in a couple of minutes why it was theoretical rather than practical. Uh, some good surprises, too. Uh, in our procurement uh, recommendations, uh, we discovered that some of the basic elements of force projection east of Suez, east of Suez, Persian Gulf, Red Sea, uh, uh, the western part of the Indian Ocean, that some of this force projection could be accomplished uh, at costs which were lower than we had initially expected. A, because you can change basing policy, which we did with the opening of the base in Abu Dhabi. It costs a lot less to have a base in Abu Dhabi than to have a base in black Africa, because in Abu Dhabi they pay for it, whereas in black Africa you pay for it, uh, which, is the sh which, is a, which is a very short capsule description, but it's not an inaccurate one. And the other thing is that uh, uh, with uh, the introduction of civilian uh, procedures in shipbuilding, we have been able to cut the costs of some of our force projection vessels very substantially uh, with some very, very good trade-offs. Those were, that's good news, good surprises. Now, my worries. Uh, uh, where, where has all of this, where has all of this, uh, 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 how has all of this evolved uh, in very recent uh, 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 years. Uh, first of all, uh, budget constraints. 
economic crisis, a rupture strategic of the first order, happened uh, literally in the months which followed the issuing of the White Paper. In the short run, triennial defense budget, we're okay. There have been some marginal cuts, uh, but you know, overall, uh, uh, with some elements of the economic stimulus plan flowing over into defense, the reductions uh, over the 2010-2012 period have been kept, uh, in, in my view, uh, because there's still some debate as to how, how big they will turn out to be at the end, or probably less than a billion euro, uh, over an aggregate in spending over those three years of around 100 billion euro. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, one is always unhappy to lose a few hundred million euro, uh, but when you compare it to 100 billion euro, it's not a game changer. So that is not what worries me in itself. But what does worry me is that as soon as you start moving away from the initial envelope and you move into reductions, and of course post-2012, we have presidential elections next year, the, uh, the bill for coping with the economic crisis in terms of higher indebtedness has still to be paid uh, over the next five to ten years, a problem all of the industrialized countries share, uh, at least those of North America, Western Europe, and Japan, uh, uh, we are going, probably going to have more reductions down the road. Now, when that happens in our system, it brings out the worst in uh, our turf battles. First of all, precisely in order to avoid turf battles, we, was, we tend to spread the reductions equally amongst all of the services. Now, that may be pleasing bureaucratically, but it, it makes you lose sense of priority. Secondly, old programs survive better than new programs. You cancel the next generation ELIN satellite, for example, which we have not done, by the way. Uh, you're not destroying any jobs because the jobs haven't been created yet. But if you cut down the number of Rafale you, you build, you are destroying jobs which already exist. Thirdly, Big programs suffer less than small programs, which is another way of saying Augustine law programs, which tend to be the costlier ones, make it better through budget reductions than small Moore's law programs do. So you entirely lose the sense of priority. And in the French case, this has been translated most society that future disasters, whether uh, deliberate or inadvertent, whether uh, man-made or natural, uh, uh, the notion hasn't fed sufficiently into the bureaucracy and into the society that it's actually worth spending money on this and not simply creating organizations. And fourthly, and most importantly, uh, the lack of integration of policy. Now, here you have two levels of responsibility. Uh, one, which is the minor level, uh, but it's symptomatic of the bigger problem, which I'll come to, uh, is that we didn't, we didn't set up, we finally didn't set up the uh, National Security Advisory Commission, uh, which would normally have been in a position to provide what I would call integrative capacity, looking at Tunisia in its various facets, making recommendations and so on. That has not happened. 
uh, uh, but that harkens to the bigger problem is that is integration at the very end of the day is, on, is going, only going to be as good as the quality of the top level governance. You talked about your problems, we have our problems. We mishandled Tunisia. Our president actually, and that's, I, I, I give him credit for that in a way, uh, has apologized for the way we got it wrong, which is unusual for uh, politicians and possibly even more so French politicians to do. Uh, they're, they're not usually in the apology business. Uh, 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 well, he did apologize. He was right to apologize uh, at both the substantive and the psychological level. But still, it would have been better not to have had to apologize. And this is, of course, the problem that you are facing uh, quite literally as I, as I speak uh, with the contingency, uh, which are contingencies opened by the events uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Egypt. So that brings us back to the initial point, uh, and others have made it. That is, uh, yes, of course, you do want to have a Nixon-Kissinger relationship, you want somebody who has a belt on Shaung, uh, uh, and so on. But even when you do have that combination, you still, want to have, you still want to get the theory right, you want to get the doctrine right, and you want to have the organizations uh, in hand. Uh, uh, we have done much of the latter points. Uh, the quality of our governance, once again, that remains of the essence and that is something which, of course, uh, is not for me, uh, is not for me uh, to, uh, to judge. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we do have some time for... I'd be delighted. Yeah. ...to questions. Sure. Me. I'd be happy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for a very thorough presentation. Um, I wish we could uh, found uh, comfort in uh, your failings. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I missed the first three minutes of your presentation, but I'm sure that even in these three minutes, you didn't mention not uh, the EU, neither uh, mm -hmm. NATO. Mm -hmm. To what extent... Uh, these uh, two frameworks are relevant to the concept of uh, defense security uh, in the French uh, view. Yeah, we have to re react to that. First, NATO. Uh, well, yes, of course, the white paper did state that there, were, there was no particular reason why we should not reintegrate the military structure of NATO. Uh, uh, we didn't say it more forcefully than that, I would say. Uh, we, did, we did not write... France has to join the military structure of NATO. We simply said there's no, there's no drawback to us doing so. Uh, the president did it. The president was right to do it. Uh, is it very important that we did it? It's, I think it's pretty important for us. I don't think it changes much in terms of, uh, uh, of the way NATO uh, operates. Uh, but, you know, NATO, NATO's position in the world was very well summarized by Don Rumsfeld. And Don Rumsfeld I have no patience with his policies, but as you know, he was always very good with words. He knew how to describe situations. A few days after 9-11, he says, the mission determines the coalition, which was his polite way of saying, uh, NATO is not the tool of choice for dealing with this particular contingency. But beyond that time-specific uh, meaning to his message, there was a broader meaning to the message, and that is, it's no longer... A, uh, an unlimited liability association dealing with a limited geographical space, but a limited liability association dealing with an unlimited geographical space. So it's pick and choose NATO. Very important. <laughs> I'll let that play out. Uh, I can't compete against such nice music. Uh, 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 NATO, uh, NATO has become an alliance of choice, not an alliance of necessity. It's still very important in terms of its ability to produce interoperability, military interoperability, which is key if you want to create a given coalition at a given time, a given place. But it certainly has lost the centrality it used to have. Uh, uh, the EU 
I didn't mention because I didn't want to get into a very long disquisition, but I'll keep it very brief. Uh, the Lisbon Treaty states in one of its articles that common security and defense policy, it is called CSDP, is at the service of the EU's foreign policy, which is another way of saying that it's not a security and not a defense policy, that it's simply the military accompagnement, accompaniment of an existent or non-existent foreign policy. Uh, uh, that is the extent and the limit of what the EU means in military and national security terms. I'm not saying this in a denigrating manner. Uh, CSDP and the four ESDP's missions have overall been successful on their own terms. There have been 25 or so missions. Uh, Ace was a, a fantastic success. Uh, Bosnia has been okay. Uh, 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 the prevention of genocide in the Congo was a phenomenal success, etc. These are important things. They were useful, but they do not actually have direct bearing on national security and defense. It's another game. It's a foreign, it's a foreign policy game. Useful game but a different game. Uh, and I would add, but that will take me, if, if I go on for much longer, you will shoot at me. Uh, uh, I would add that there is great uncertainty as to where the EU will, over the next few years, take itself. That will be very much a function of its handling of the crisis of the euro, whether this will lead to federalization, uh, which uh, is probably the only way to save the euro, or whether it will not lead to federalization, in which case Monsieur Van Rompuy may have been quite right last November when he said if there is no euro, th that will be the end of the European Union. Uh, I hope that he was wrong in his statement, uh, but then, after all, he is supposed to be the expert, not me. <laughs> I call it a very good, because we don't have too much no, time. No, 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 I, don't I don't want to uh, tread on John's... Uh... Uh, on the behalf of all of us, I want to... On the behalf of all of us, I want to thank very much uh, Professor Isbuk for his eloquent uh, presentation. And I want to invite, I think, Professor Itamar Abinovich to introduce the next speaker. But I don't see him out here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so just be... Just be that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>